In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just about a hundred years ago, a young English girl approached her mother and asked, Mommy, what is a saint? The mother's response would go on to inspire that much beloved hymn that we just sang. I sing a song of the saints of God. Set to the cheery tune, Grand Isle, in the American church, by a retired Episcopal priest for the hymnal 1940. The hymn remains one of the most popular across the Anglican communion. Curiously, the song is relatively unknown at this point in its native England, but that's their problem. <laughs> One was a doctor. Well, in step St. Luke, the physician tonight. As you know, St. Luke wrote two books of the Bible, the Gospel according to St. Luke and the book of Acts. They go together, right? Book, Luke, Acts. Without Luke, we wouldn't have the story of the Good Samaritan, many of the most important details of our Lord's birth, Our Lady's great canticle, the Magnificat. Without the book of Acts, we wouldn't even have record of the day of Pentecost or St. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. I can't imagine Christianity, especially Christmas, without St. Luke. One was a queen. This is St. Margaret of Scotland, an 11th century Scottish queen who devoted her whole life to prayer and feeding orphans and caring for the poorest of the poor as well as founding monasteries. This is not exactly how you and I think of living the life of royalty. Thankfully, the Bible teaches us that real royalty, Christ himself came not to be served, but to serve. Saints seek service over self. One was a shepherdess on the green. I'll take hymnology trivia for 200. <laughs> St. Joan of Arc, the heroine of France, was tending her parents' sheep before she experienced a series of visions that equipped her for leadership, even military leadership at 19 as a woman in that era. And she turned the tide of the bloody Hundred Years' War with England, of course leading the French to victory. But she quickly ran afoul of the religious authorities Religious authorities are easy to run afoul of. And they ran a pro-English court who fancied her a heretic, and she was burned at the stake at the Place de Vaux Marche in Rouen. And before the pyre was lit, she instructed a priest to hold high a crucifix for her to see and for him to shout the prayers loud enough so they could be heard over the roar of the flame. Impressive lady. One was a soldier, another French saint, St. Martin of Tours. He was forced to serve in the Roman army about a hundred years before the collapse of the empire. And before he was bishop in what is close to modern-day Tours, France, and the Loire Valley, on a frigid day, Martin used his soldier's sword to slice his beautiful ermine cloak, giving half of it to a cold beggar after he believed he saw the face of Jesus in the shivering man. In one variation on the theme, the next day, Martin's cloak had been made whole again as a gift from Jesus in thanksgiving that Martin had found a better use for sword than battle as an implement of kindness and compassion. Owing to his side hustle as a good winemaker, he is the patron saint of French wine and winemakers. He is also the patron saint of soldiers. He's a hell of a guy. 
One was a priest. <laughs> John Dunn is the priest in this song. The great Anglican priest and preacher and sometime dean at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Dunn is, is probably best known, however, for his poetry, isn't he, at this point. That's a shame because his sermons were fantastic. They just were long. <laughs> you remember some of the poems, even if you are digging back to high school, um, with For Whom the Bell Tolls and Batter My Heart, Three Person God, uh, Death Be Not Proud. I think that's probably my favorite today. It could change tomorrow. Death Be Not Proud, Though Some Have Called Thee Mighty and Dreadful, For Thou Art Not So, and Death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. He got it right. One was slain by a fierce wild beast. According to one legend, St. Ignatius of Antioch may have been one of the little children whom Jesus gathered together in his arms and blessed. He may have been a contemporary of our Lord, in other words, or at least very close to it. For certain, St. Ignatius was among the first generation of disciples to be called Christians, which the Bible tells us began in Antioch. Like St. Paul, Ignatius wrote letters and traveled to preach and teach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Eventually, he ran afoul of the Roman authorities and was arrested for refusing to worship Roman gods. He was tossed, as many of you remember, into the Colosseum and devoured by lions for entertainment. So if you're keeping track so far, that's a doctor, queen, shepherdess, soldier, priest, and martyr. Extraordinary saints of old with a capital S spanning almost 1,700 years. In the final measures of the hymn, however, we are told that saints aren't just a thing of the past. And they can even be found among what you and I would be tempted to call ordinary men and women going about ordinary things. You can meet them in school, or in lanes, or at sea, in church, or in trains, or in shops, or at tea. The Bible and the prayer book say the same thing in their own way. This is because all who are in Christ through baptism and faith are called to be saints. Are in fact already saints in the making. I find immense, even overwhelming comfort in how St. Paul addressed even his angriest letters to the saints in so-and-so. Right down to the corrupt Corinthians. By contrast, when I was in the biggest trouble of my teenage years, and there was a lot of it, nobody ever once addressed me as St. Charleston. <laughs> and I'll go on the record here and say it still has not happened. But Paul, Paul insisted first and foremost that grace set the believer apart categorically and fundamentally. That we have been made holy by trusting in what God has done for us, not by what we have done for Him. And this is the one necessary disposition of heart that makes saints, well, saints. Most, most importantly, and finally, All Saints Tide brings to light that the ultimate hope of our calling lies beyond any horizon that we can currently see. Which is to say, despite horrible seasons in life, pain, grief, and the suffering we all experience, there breaks a yet more glorious day.
all of this is because Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. 